Welcome to Beyond Sport with Fiona Stewart. If you've been listening for a while, welcome back. If you're new to the show, I'm your host, Fiona. My passion for sport really started when I was a competitive swimmer. This led me to study sport development at university whilst also working within the sporting industry. I'm a huge believer in sport being used as a tool for good. Each week, I'll bring you an episode with someone involved in the sporting world. It could be your local high school teacher or your childhood or current sporting hero. The difference is that it's not your typical type of questions. We talk about the highs and lows in their journey through sport, but also what they've learned from it and how it's made them who they are today. There's also a strong focus on how being involved in sport can impact the community. If you haven't already, make sure you hit follow wherever you're listening so you don't miss the drop of each new episode. If you're after some bonus content, then you can check out our Instagram or Facebook page at Beyond Sport with Fiona Stewart. After a week off, I'm so excited to bring you an episode with three-time Olympic swimmer Alicia Coots. Representing Australia at the 2008, 2012 and 2016 Olympics, Alicia came away with five Olympic medals, including a gold medal and making Olympic history in the 2012 4x100 freestyle relay. In this episode, Alicia talks about her early years in the sport, including what happened on the day of her first swimming competition at seven years old, We chat about the benefits being involved in swimming has given her and the lessons she's learnt along the way. It was an absolute pleasure to chat with Alicia. As a busy mum of three, she put time aside in her day to share her journey with us. You may hear a minute or two of her youngest in the background, but push through because it's an important message. Let's get into it. Alicia, can you tell us about your sport? You're a fellow swimmer and how you got into it. Uh, yeah, so I actually got into swimming um, as a baby. Uh, I started learning to swim lessons when I was 18 months old because I actually used to, like when my mum was hanging the washing out on the clothesline in our backyard, I used to climb my neighbour's six foot high pool fence while oh. <laughs> she was hanging it out. And I'd go and knock on their door and I'd ask if I could go swimming in their pool. So mum would like, you know, one minute I'm there and the next minute I wasn't. And my neighbour would be screaming out over the fence, Julie, Alicia's over here again. Like, So my mum freaked out because she was like, oh, my God, she's just going to go over there by herself and drown. So she took me to learn to swim lessons and that's how I got into swimming. <laughs> it's very Aussie. Like that seems to be the Aussie way. It's like, oh, yeah, we got into swimming yeah. to learn to swim. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Oh, gosh. Yeah, so apparently mum said that I, any any body of water, I just wanted to be in it. So that's how I got into swimming. So luckily, you know, could have been dangerous otherwise. Yeah, yeah. It's certainly a safety thing. Most kids in Australia get into it because of safety. What was it that made you want to do like competitive swimming? Um, so like my brothers, I had two older brothers and they... Um, like they did learn to swim as well and I we all you know went to club nights and stuff and uh, I think like I just enjoyed racing Mm -hmm. and I actually had my first ever actual swimming carnival when I was seven Mm -hmm. so a competitive swimming carnival um, was actually the day that my dad passed away Uh, so he died of non-Hodgkin's lymphoma and my first carnival was that afternoon. It was at my um, my club pool, which was at the time was Springwood. And I remember my mum saying that I wasn't going to be going to my swimming carnival because of obviously my dad had passed away. And and I remember being really upset. And I said, you know, I, I wanted to go and I wanted to swim for my dad because, you know, even just going to swimming lessons and stuff, my dad really thought that I had something and he Mm -hmm. thought that I could be a really good swimmer and he used to tell me that he thought I'd go to the Olympics one day and I think um yeah like he just was my number one believer uh and I really wanted to go to this swim meet and swim for my dad which is what I said to my mom my grandparents took me and I swam all I think it was like 25 meters because I was seven yeah and I swam all my races and I won all of them like apparently to the point where I was like doing the 25 freestyle and I was looking back waiting for the other kids to catch up because I was so far in front yeah like as a seven-year-old that's a big life event 
how do you, was it, do you reckon that's how you connected to him? Like that's how you helped process that? Yeah, I think so. Um, and like, you know, I always felt like, uh, yeah, he was my, my number one fan, I guess, uh, as a swimmer. So, you know, like it was always my goal. I wanted to go to the Olympics for my dad. Mm -hmm. And like, I always had that drive in me, you know, as an athlete, you know, that you, you have that, those qualities that you're driven and uh, you're competitive and you just don't stop until you achieve what you want. Mm -hmm. Uh, and I think, yeah, that's that was my sort of driving force behind me. Oh, wow. I've got goosebumps. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> wow. And did you, like, have that belief in yourself that you could, you know, go to the Olympics or make the Australian swim team? Or did that kind of inner voice come from your dad? I think uh, initially it sort of came from my dad. And it wasn't until I went to Pampax, I think, in... 2010 that I actually thought that I could go to the Olympics mm -hmm. well I mean like I, or that I could be a massive like threat at an Olympic level um I mean I went to Beijing in 2008 and that was a really big shock to a lot of people including myself I never expected to make that team honestly but it wasn't until 2010 that I think I actually really believed in myself that I could win an Olympic medal Mm -hmm. So like, you know, one thing to make an Olympic team and to, to be on the team and, and, and compete, but, you know, another level to then step up and win an actual medal. Mm, yeah. And it's the, it's the swimmers that are, I guess, like finishing on the podium that, you know, their names and you know, their names, like all these years later, you're, you're like, oh, this is who it is. And yeah, so you can make an Olympic final, but that's a big step up to an Olympic medal. And you did, you got five Olympic medals in London, which is you know, pretty amazing in itself, but also like the Australian swim team wasn't that strong in London either. No, yeah, it was, um, it was kind of like, I guess, a disappointing to come back from London and to feel like I'd done so well to have, I guess, a bit of a tarnished reputation mm -hmm. of the team because of, you know, the whole still knock scandal and everything that went on and that, you know, everyone was saying it was our worst Olympics ever. And it was kind of like, you know, like I just won five medals. I just <laughs> equaled Shane Gould, Annie Ian Thorpe as, you know, the third Australian in history to win five medals in Olympic games. And it just really, yeah, it just really dampened my results for myself. Mm -hmm. Like, no, you did amazing. But yeah, I can hear what you're saying is like, you did amazing and you basically were the superstar of the Australian team. <laughs> but yeah, no one acknowledged that really. They were too busy talking about what the boys did. Yeah, yeah, which was really, it was really disheartening. Yeah, just kind yeah. of felt like it didn't matter or nobody cared at well, the I time. Cared. So. <laughs> I certainly <Thank> cared, <laughs> I noticed. <laughs> So we've, we've mentioned a few, but are there any like significant milestones? Like we spoke about the first Olympics, the second Olympics, wins, losses, injuries along your sporting journey, like anything that really stands out? I guess when I think about it, like obviously London was the big um, moment that stood out for me. I guess the sort of start of my career being Delhi, winning mm -hmm. five gold medals there was, I guess, where it started to snowball for me and things started to pick up. and. I just kind of rolled with it and just got better and better and better. But then when you talk about like injuries and losses and things like that, uh, a big thing that stood out for me in my career was a big turning point for me, like mentally, which was really difficult, was Glasgow in 2014. Uh, so I went over to Glasgow and I had been really sick. I'd, I used to work at the RSPCA and I'd contracted something called Campylobacter, uh, which is like kind of like a stomach bug, I guess you'd say, and you know, constant like sickness and illness. And uh, it took me a long time to get over that. I was still sick over in Glasgow. I'd been sick for weeks prior, you know, on multiple courses of antibiotics and nothing was helping it. You know, I'd been training really well and then I went over there and I didn't perform the way that I wanted to. And that was the first time internationally that I'd gone away and I hadn't achieved what I wanted. Mm -hmm. um, I, the first time I'd gone away where I hadn't done a PB uh, in my events, you know, to then win medals. And, you know, it was, it was real, that was really tough for me, even though I knew I'd been sick, I really struggled with that mentally with not, achieve 
achieving what I wanted. Mm-hmm. And then going to Pampax after that, you know, I sort of turned it around. You know, I won the Hunter Butterfly. Uh, didn't didn't go as well in the I am as I'd wanted to. But yeah, that, that was a hard point for me. And then not long after I got back from Pampax, I actually my dog knocked me over in my backyard. So she's a border collie cross Kelpie, but she looks like a, a big Labrador. Uh, and she's like kind of a, like a white kind of color. Mm-hmm. So everyone thinks she's a lab, but she's not, but she's just this big buff head. And she was chasing my other little dog and she's just run into the side of my leg at such speed that I literally cartwheeled in the air and landed with my left outstretched. Mm -hmm. And I remember I was lying on the ground and I thought, oh my God, my arm, like my shoulder, that was so painful. Like I'm literally on the ground. My dog's like trying to lick me to death. Like, are you okay? (laughs) You know? And I remember this was on a Saturday. And so like I went inside and I remember icing it and thinking, oh, that really hurt. Like hopefully, you know, there's no injury there. And I went training on the Monday morning and I said to my coach, you know, this happened to me on the weekend. Like, I don't know how it's going to be in the water. I just want to, you know, I'll get in and I'll see how it feels. And I couldn't take a single stroke. Like it was, I was in so much pain. So then I had to go get scans and everything done. And it turned out that I had a, um, a labrum, tear on my labrum of my, oh. my left shoulder. So for the next, then what was it? I think that happened in October. So early October, so October, November, December. The next four months, I couldn't swim a stroke. I had to kick with my arms down by my side with a snorkel on. I had to ride a bike. Like I couldn't, like I couldn't swim. And so I went to nationals for 2015 nationals. And I'd literally only sort of taken my first stroke early February. And I missed the team. I, I missed the team in a hundred butterfly. I like just missed the team. I came third. And I didn't swim the Trinidad I am because my shoulder was so painful that I mm-hmm. couldn't do all the strokes. And I came sixth in the Hunter Freestyle. So we thought, oh, oh, maybe they'll pick me for the relay. But then they didn't. And that was the first time I'd missed the team in my career. And I struggled that with that like a lot. Um, it took a lot for me to want to go training. I, I kind of lost the love for it. I'm like, maybe I should just retire. Like, uh, cause my options were either have surgery and retire because there was no way I was going to get back for Rio or, uh, literally spend every day on the physio table, getting it worked on, getting injections in it, uh, trying to, uh, I guess sort of maintain it and make sure it didn't get worse that's the option that I went with you know I I did have other distractions that year you know I was getting married so I was organizing my wedding and things like that but you know there was often times where I'd go to training and I'd stand next to my coach and I'd stand on the side of the pool and I was like I don't want to swim today and he's like that's okay you know like he he understood what I was going through and how hard that was for me and then I finally made the decision right okay I'm going to swim for Rio I'm going to retire on my own terms uh, so I managed to swim onto Rio, finished fifth in my turn that I am. So kind of bookended my career, fifth mm-hmm. in, in my first Olympics in Beijing, fifth in Rio. Wasn't the time that I wanted, you know, like, but with the situation that I was in with, you know, training and pain and just trying to basically muscle through it. My coach worked out, I swam over 2 million strokes in pain to make it to Rio. Yeah. So, I mean, like, I guess, I guess, you know, it shows the ups and downs that you go through as an athlete, the toll that an injury can have on you mentally, not only physically, but also mentally. Mm -hmm. Um, And I guess the, the kind of person that you have to be to overcome things like that to, I guess, push forward. And, you know, it was important to me that I finished my career on my own terms and I managed to do that, uh, which was important to me. But yeah, like, you know, like a roller coaster. <laughs> yeah. And it's funny that it's not funny. Like it's awful that that happened to you. But the, the funny thing is the same thing happened to me when I was about 10 and I do have a Labrador. So it was a Labrador that did it. Um, same thing ran into me, knocked me over at the, you know, knee, but I broke my wrist. So it was a lot less intense. It was just six weeks in a cast and I was 10. So I healed cr- quickly, but yeah, like yeah. it's funny that dogs do that. Don't they? <laughs> Yeah, like they just, 
have no social awareness, like spatial awareness or anything around them. They're <laughs> just like a bull at a gate. <laughs> yes. Yeah. And like, I know how you feel in terms of like having an injury and not being able to, or even wanting to get in the pool. Like there's, I tore my rotator cuff when I was 18 and I remember standing on the edge next to my coach going, you know, t- my whole team had warmed up and I was like, I don't want to get in. Like I drove here. Yes. But like, I don't, I don't want to swim anymore. Like I don't want to mm-hmm. kick with my arm by my side with a snorkel on because I hate it. And I did end up stopping for a while because of that. Like I just couldn't hack it. And then I ended up making a little bit of a comeback at some stage, but what was it like, I guess, having that determination to finish the career on your own terms, even though it wasn't the result you wanted and you were injured, like how did you make that decision that it was important to you to finish on your own terms and not just let this injury beat it? Yeah. I guess I always felt like if I didn't give the, give it a go to actually compete in Rio that I would regret it the rest Mm -hmm. of my life if I retired there and then like I knew that what I'd achieved in my sport uh, I was really happy with but I kind of felt like as a person I couldn't just give up Mm -hmm. like I had to literally fight to the end and that's what I needed to do uh, I guess to be okay with the fact that this was the end of my career and I went down fighting if Mm -hmm. that makes sense. Yeah, 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 definitely. Yeah, because I know that was one thing that I regretted is when I let that injury kind of like let me stop swimming. And you know, I started uni and all of the other things that life throws at you when you're a young young adult. And I remember making a comeback a few years later, only to fall over um, and break my elbow. But even then, like I did get back in the pool, and they said, you know, I was a butterfly, and they're like, you know, you're not actually going to be able to do butterfly again because you're not going to be able to like extend your arm straight. And I was like, as if, like, watch me, I'm not letting another injury stop me from swimming again. And yeah, being able to like rehab to that point, and I didn't do it great, and I had to fully requalify for everything, <laughs> like even states, Victorian states, I had to requalify yeah. for because I hadn't swam for so long. And yeah. I remember that was my last race at that states, and I didn't even qualify for the butterfly. I qualified for hundred free, and I got out and I was like, yeah. okay, I'm done. Like this is my swimming. I'm happy to hang up the goggles. And like it was kind of heartbreaking, and people were like, are you sure? Like you just spent six months really working towards getting this goal I'm like yeah I just wanted to prove that I will that I had it in me and I'm happy to yeah. let it be a little bit now yeah yeah I get that 100%. Mm. it's interesting isn't it it must be like a like a little switch that either athletes or swimmers have like that type a like nope I'm not ready yet <laughs> yep and it's funny like after I had my first son I had some people kind of get in my ear like oh you know you should like make a comeback for Tokyo and stuff and like I got in the pool and I swam a little bit and I was like no Mm -hmm. I'm ready like you know I retired I didn't want to be somebody that retired and then decided to come back like and I'm like you know what I'm 30 now like I've had that part of my life I've moved on I have kids now you know like leave it to someone else (laughs) (laughs) let the young ones do it now (laughs) Um, exactly exactly (laughs) my body wouldn't hold up anyway (laughs) I'm I'm 26 and I feel like my body doesn't even hold up in the pool anymore (laughs) Um, yeah yeah definitely like that if you could go back and relive a moment it, it could be a good moment it could be a bad moment what would it be and why if I could go back and relive a moment, I think it would be, oh, I, I think it would be probably, that's a really hard question. I know, and I'm I, sorry. <laughs> and like, I remember reading the question yesterday and, and I was sort of stumped on it then. I think if I had to relive a moment, it would probably be Glasgow, mm-hmm. only because I'd like to redo it. Mm-hmm. Like I'd love, I'd like to, I don't know. And I know how negative I felt in my mind in that competition that I'd like to be able to go back and turn it around, mm-hmm. I think. Because as I said earlier, you know, it it didn't go the way that I wanted it to, you know, with the illness and everything that I'd had. I think if I could go back that and I would reset my mindset. Yeah. So like not, that time. not change the fact that you were sick in the lead up, but change like 
the mindset while you were in competition to maybe perform a little bit better is that what you mean yeah and to I think um maybe be a little bit less harsh on myself you know when you're a swimmer and you're an athlete and you just put so much expectation on yourself and on your own shoulders Mm -hmm. that you expect you expect to just perform on every occasion and as like as I was saying before the hardest part for me was the fact that that's the first international competition I went to where I didn't perform up to my own standard Mm -hmm. so I think that would be the probably the best one for me to go back to and to relive and to I guess be more open and have a more open mind about you know what I was going through and and um not be so negative about it Mm, I love that and I like that it's not even the performance that you wanted to change it's that mindset and like how harsh you were on yourself and I can totally relate with being being in that mindset and be like I didn't do the as as well as I wanted to and and being really critical on yourself and be like well didn't Mm. really affect too many other people like it's fine yeah yeah Mm, that's an interesting one would there be a positive one that you'd want to like relive as well? Um, I guess like you can't go past uh, the relay in London mm-hmm. where we won gold. I'd love to, I guess, go back and you kind of like, I kind of look back and I think about it now and it just happens so, like it just feels like it just happened so fast and like I didn't get to really enjoy it. Mm-hmm. I'd love to go back and I'd love to stand on the dice and I'd love to sing the national anthem again. I think that's one thing that, it just felt like it was just such a whirlwind and just it was so much disbelief in the fact that we'd actually done it that you don't really I guess take it all in at the time yeah yeah yeah, that makes sense like you're just so like oh my gosh swept up in the moment and be like oh like Mm. not actually absorbing it and enjoying it and I guess that's yeah life as well like I know I was kind of like that when I got engaged I was kind of like oh my god like I'm just floating through life and I don't know where I am yeah yeah Yeah. I know that feeling I honestly don't even remember like being on the dais and singing the national anthem and stuff like it just feels like it's it was just all a blur and just (laughs) yeah so um, that's something that I'd love to relive yeah and, and you could probably like go back and find footage of it but it's not the same as like experiencing it in the moment yeah 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 Hmm, that's an interesting one yeah I like that answer (laughs) (laughs) now we we might be on the same page for this one but what are some of the benefits sport has provided you as an individual that's transferred over to other avenues of your life so you're a mum of three boys now so you've got a very hectic Mm, life (laughs) I do it is it is very hectic I swear little boys are just so full of energy that they never stop you know I thought that I might have a little girl that might sit down and want to have a tea party with me, but no, my boys are just like wreck it Ralph and they're just like, go, go, go 24 seven. One thing that I've definitely um, transitioning from swimming into the workforce, a big thing for me. And I found that uh, with my job and, um, you know, being hired by people was the fact that you're so disciplined Mm -hmm. and people love that people love how focused you are how driven how disciplined you are I found that I didn't have an issue getting a job because of my background with swimming and you know people knowing how determined you are that you operate you know the way that you operate uh, as an athlete really transitions you into the workforce and but, uh, because people know, you know, how driven you are and how task orientated you are. They love that. Uh, so, you know, I never had an issue finding a job uh, out of uh, after I finished swimming. You know, I've worked as a paralegal at the DPP uh, since 2018, which I love. I love doing that. You know, I am very task orientated. I, I operate very well. You know, my, uh, you know, my boss's love that about me as a person so uh, I do I do uh, I guess thank swimming for making me making me that person and um, making me so driven which has been really helpful also you know obviously having to uh, be prepared Mm -hmm. (laughs) having to get out of the house at a certain time you know like I set an alarm 
I've got four different alarms on my phone. I have a wake up alarm. I've got an alarm like we need to leave this now that my son now goes to prep. Uh, we, I have to pick him up from school now. Like, you know, just I'm so organized with those things because it's, you know, it's just the person that you, you are from being an athlete, you know, you're organized and um, you operate to a, <laughs> to a schedule really. Mm-hmm. So, and I think swimmers, and there's probably a few other sports that are like that, but because it's such a time consuming sport in terms of like how much you have to be, you know, at the pool at a certain time, otherwise your coach is like, yeah. makes you swim <laughs> extra laps or something. You get some kind of thing if you get in late. Yeah. Like I'm the exact same and people always laugh because I'm like, oh, my lunch breaks are scheduled like to the minute. Like, I don't know what you're talking about. You can't just throw in this <laughs> random task. Like you can email me about it a week ahead if you want to. <laughs> Yeah, um, yeah and that's probably a bit of a swimming thing like I've even started like rostering other people's lunch breaks and like blocking them out in their schedules <laughs> yeah yeah you're like you need to take lunch now because we operate to a schedule <laughs> yeah or like because you have this and this and this and otherwise you won't have time to do it so yeah that's the thing swimming gave me as well like that time organization and I look at you know my sister who did netball or my partner who did cycling and triathlon they just don't have it the same as what I do <laughs> Yeah, yeah, definitely. Uh, I think it's definitely a swimming thing. Yeah, it must be. Yeah. Now, is there a lesson you've learned along the way that you'd want to share? A lesson, I think, probably goes back to the, I guess, being not being so hard on yourself. I think that's a big lesson that I, I learned throughout my swimming career. I guess coming back to the Glasgow thing and being mean to yourself, you know, just kind of let things go with the flow I guess I used to have this sort of thing that I used to tell myself when I was swimming is you can only do what you can do and just see what happens and I I guess that's one lesson that I sort of tried to live by uh, when I was swimming sometimes you sometimes it happens sometimes it doesn't and I guess don't sweat the small stuff really Mm -hmm. yeah yeah and it takes that pressure or tries to take that pressure off that you put on yourself and I know I was the exact same put all this pressure on myself and then I'd have to be like, I don't know, like if it doesn't happen, it's okay. <laughs> yeah, yeah. My coach and I used to um like have a chat before I would go up to marshalling and, you know, like I used to get really nervous. I used to like sometimes to the point where I was in tears, you know, I, I went up for the 200 IM final in London mm-hmm. and I actually <laughs> was in tears before I went up because I was so nervous and my coach used to say to me, and he used to say to say it to me all the time because, you know, like I'd get nervous at all the big meets. And I, he used to come and sit down and talk with me because he knew that I was too much in my head if I was sitting by myself. Mm-hmm. Um, and I was too much thinking about my race and, you know, getting, you know, all worked up about what I was meant to be doing that I needed he needed to take my mind off it so he used to come up and he used to say to me have you you know have you been nervous before and I'd say yes and how did you go I did good you know like and you know I used to say you know like you've done this a million times you've done it in training you know like you know how to do this and he used, used to get into my head and just to kind of remind me that, you know, I've done this race a million times. I've trained for it. I've been training my ass off. I've been swimming so well. Like, don't let the mental side of it get to you and fall in a heap, basically. So, you know, I really needed him to sort of just reiterate to me, you know, talking. It really helped. Uh, it helped me so much as an athlete. So, yeah, I like literally when I was younger I used to make myself physically sick before I used to go up uh, to race like I used to get so nervous (laughs) oh that's awful I know I'm I'm a bit of an anxious tummy like I was actually saying this morning how nervous I was about interviewing you and I was like I think I might throw up like that's how nervous I'm feeling (laughs) I used to like actually get sick like And it, it's funny because like kind of, it was like flipping a coin when I made, sorry, crying baby, uh, when I made my first Open Australian team, which was Beijing in 2008, 
like I just flipped a coin and all of a sudden I just had this confidence that I never had before and yeah like even my psychologist she was just like I just couldn't believe um like you were just a different athlete and Mm -hmm. it's like yeah it was it was just like flicking a switch all of a sudden I was just more confident and able to do it without bursting into tears like a kid (laughs) well I guess it's like the validation that you deserve to be there because you made the team like you were there with the best yeah yeah it is it's interesting how much like your mindset and I know my coach used to tell me this when I was young but like I never really listened I was like yeah whatever how much your mindset (laughs) can either win or lose your race or like that can be the difference between getting a PB and bumming out like it's how you yeah are thinking just in that half an hour before you race yeah exactly exactly mm. and you know like you, you look at a lot of swimmers and you can tell that they're nervous because they've got that you know the nervous leg going and they're just continuously moving or like they can't sit down like they've got ants in their pants and they're using all their energy before they even get in the pool all that nervous energy and it just by the you hit the water and you just feel like oh my god I've got nothing I'm like mm. I'm, I'm exhausted because <laughs> you've been using all that nervous energy in the lead up that you don't have anything to actually race with. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. And I think it just shows also like the importance of like sports psychology and like the evolution of that as well. Like you would have seen throughout your career, the evolution of it. And even now it's like evolved again. Yeah, definitely. Like when I was a bit younger, there wasn't really a lot of sports psychologists and it's just the fact that I was at the AIS and you know we had access to those things you know if you're at a home program you didn't really have access to those you know psychologists and nutritionists and stuff like that so you know I felt very lucky in the fact that I did have access to those people once you know I was up you know in the big league sort of thing Mm, yeah definitely now this is a question I ask because I love the the fact that sport can be used as a tool to you know develop yes oneself but also like the community is there a time that you've been involved in a project where sport's been used as a tool? So after I retired, I um, I did a, f- uh, a few uh, like swim clinics with some kids in Canberra and uh, around Canberra and stuff like that, which I really enjoyed. And I felt, um, you know, some kids got a lot out of it. Um, their parents, you know, really were appreciative of the pro like the program that I'd run and uh, did with it with their kids and I really enjoyed it and yeah I felt like it was beneficial for them and yeah that's kind of the only real thing that I've sort of done with swimming I guess since I retired is just those few swim clinics and stuff but I don't really like I haven't really had much to do with sort of swimming Australia or anything uh, since I did retire I think you know, they, they tend to want to work with people that are still swimming mm-hmm. uh, with their clinics and things like that. But yeah, no, I felt I got a lot out of that and the kids got a lot out of that. And, you know, I did have, uh, I guess, some parents actually approached me asking me if I could coach their kids, uh, <laughs> which, which was fun. I did a couple of like little coaching sessions with some kids and stuff like that. And uh, I did get asked to be an assistant coach at a club in Canberra, but then I ended up, you know, getting the DPP position instead. So Next to me is something that I'll always love and enjoy. And, you know, I'm always happy to be involved with uh, little projects and stuff along the way. You know, people tell me I'd be a fantastic coach, but yeah. There's still years for that. You can do that when the kid, when the boys are a bit older. <laughs> yeah, it's just a bit hard with three little ones at home. Yeah. 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 And, and also the hours, you know, daycare is only open till six o'clock. So well, that's, that's <laughs> the thing. Of, yeah, coaching Set is... Set them up on the side of the pool <laughs> in a playpen or something. <laughs> yes, well, they've got to be big enough that they're not going to, like, do what you do and climb over pool fences. <laughs> yes, exactly, exactly. Um, you were also, a few years ago, well, it would have been before, maybe before you retired, I had in here, you were the, an ambassador for the Cancer Cancer's March Challenge. So you, you know, helped promote, I think that's where they, like, you did a certain amount of, exercise to help raise money for cancer council so like that is also something that you've done to help the community and you know you used sport to do that yeah so um I was 
it was yeah it was called the March Charge mm-hmm. and it was uh, to raise money obviously for the Cancer Council and it was also something close to my heart obviously being that my father had died from non-Hodgkin's lymphoma when I was seven as I said earlier um, so yeah I think it was really important to um, to be involved with that you know as soon as they asked me I was straight on board with it uh, and I think yeah I think it's really important I guess just to bring awareness to it uh and you know being able to incorporate sport in as well it was just the the perfect thing for me to to be involved with I guess yeah yeah and I think it's still I did a quick google last night and I think it's still you know a thing and we're in March now so (laughs) I can maybe see if I can link the the website in the bio if people want to check out what that is or you know get any ideas for next year but yeah yeah, I think it's a, a fantastic initiative and so many organizations and like charities are using sport these days as you know as a way to either raise awareness or raise money and I think that's fantastic as well yeah definitely yeah so this is a this is a loaded question you can take it any way you want but where do you see the future of sport I love the fact that there is a lot more coverage for women in sport these days, um, but also being International Women's Day, um, <laughs> important that we talk about this topic. Yeah, I love that uh, other sports are getting a lot more uh, coverage and and uh, media for women's sport as well. Also loving that the Paralympic sport is getting a lot more coverage as well. I think it's definitely heading in the right direction. You know, I know that uh, when I was first uh, making Australian teams and stuff like that, that um, the Paralympic coverage was never on the TV, which Mm -hmm. was really disheartening. Mm -hmm. You know, I have, I'm a, I'm friends with a lot of the Paralympic swimmers. So that was really, um, really a big thing that, um, that then became uh, on the live stream TV as well, which I thought was so important. So I think it's definitely heading in the right direction with coverage in, yeah, women's sport and uh, Paralympic sport, which I love. I think that's fantastic. You know, um, you look at a lot of those athletes and, you know, the obstacles that they've had to overcome to become athletes and uh, to make it on the world stage. Uh, it's such a big inspiration. And I think a lot of people, children, just can look at them in absolute awe and just it just shows the determination that somebody can have as a person you know Mm -hmm. and the obstacles that they have to overcome I think that's really important to show not only uh, people with a disability but everybody just the determination that they have as people and athletes so yeah and it's funny that you know, your first team was 2008 and that's, um, Ali Cole actually started off in a, in the club that I was at. So, yeah, you know, coming, I hadn't started swimming. I don't think at that club at that point, but you know, I was a few years later and I was like, Oh, like, that's funny. Like I didn't even know that she had raced at that point. And, you know, it was a big yeah. thing at our club when London did a better job of the coverage for the Paralympics and being able to watch her and be like, I think, we even at one stage got out of training to watch her because our coach was her coach at that first Paralympic. So yeah, I think being able to see it and witness it and watch it is such an important thing because, you know, you see it, you think you can be it. So, and same with female, like female AFL, like being able to watch it on TV. There was one, one Saturday I was like literally watching, I flicked through the channels and it was just like all women's sport. And I was like, this is fantastic. Like, this is not what would have happened five years ago. Like you would not have had cricket, footy, and I think maybe it was rugby. I can't even remember what it was, but like yeah. being able to just watch all the female sport was incredible on just on seven, nine, and 10. Yeah, exactly. And funny you talk about Ellie because Ellie was actually one of my bridesmaids for my wedding. So we're really good friends. Oh, I feel like I haven't seen her in forever oh. though. <laughs> oh, isn't it crazy? Like it's such a small world. <laughs> yeah oh yeah well we'll have to send her this episode and be like hey listen <laughs> <laughs> Got to mention. Yeah. oh well Alicia thank you so much for joining me I'm having a little bit of a, a fangirl moment because I did grow up watching you but thank you so much I know you're busy with three boys but you've taken the time out to t- talk to me and you know you've shared such amazing wisdom and lessons and thank you again for coming on the podcast No worries. Thank you for having me. It's been my absolute pleasure.
Thank you for listening to this episode of Beyond Sport with Fiona Stewart. This is a completely independent podcast that has been created to share the journey and lessons of top level sporting professionals, but also your everyday lover of sport. If you liked this podcast, I'd really appreciate if you could leave a review and share it with someone who you think would also enjoy it. Until next time.